If you have your Bibles with you, I'd ask to uh, turn to Acts, Acts chapter uh, 20, and we're going to begin reading in verse 18. Uh, Acts chapter 20, and beginning in verse 18. The Bible says in Acts chapter 20, verse 18, And when they were come to him, he said unto them, You know from the first day that I came into Asia, after what manner I have been with you at all seasons, serving the Lord with all humility of mind, and with many tears and temptations, which befell me by the laying in wait of the Jews. And, that, and how I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you, but have shewed you and have taught you publicly that from and, and from house to house, testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. And now, behold, I go bound in the Spirit unto Jerusalem, not knowing the things that shall befall me there, save that the Holy Ghost witness, witnesseth in every city, saying that bonds and afflictions abide in me. But none of those things move me, neither count I my, my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you and we praise you for all your goodness and your watch care and your blessings upon the church here at Dover. God, we pray that we would be a people that would be pleasing unto you, that we would have a testimony, Lord, that endureth and that it might be a spotlight to the other people that stand around us. God, we pray that you would bless your word, that you would cause it to be uplifting to your people this morning. And we'd be faithful to give you the praise and the glory and the honor for it all. For it is in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. Now here we uh, find a small section of Paul's ministry recorded by the Apostle Luke. And kind of in the middle, middle of this, I want you to see that the desire of Paul was to, was to finish his course with joy. Now, we all know that finishing your course is death. It means that your time is done, that you have uh, fulfilled the course that God Almighty has given you. And what Paul wanted at the end of this time, and uh, he didn't know, just as we don't always know, when the, the course is going to be done, because he lived some years after making this statement after he got to Rome, uh, but I want you to see that he wanted joy. Now, if you know your Bible, and most of you sat under my teaching for years, joy is the second fruit of the Spirit. But when you think about that, and it is a fruit of the Spirit, and it was something that Paul wanted to hang on to, when you look out about today, how many people do you see with it? How many people do you see that are genuinely happy, that rejoice in the things that the Lord has provided them? Yeah. And I would say they would be few and far between. Yeah. Um, uh, I've met a few people down through the years, and I don't think it was play acting, and I don't, I, I don't think it was being forward, but uh, I know uh, Sister Diane knows, and a few have heard of her, Miss Ingrid Buttermore. She was a nurse, and she kind of got me interested in nursing many, many years ago. But uh, one thing that struck me about Mrs. Buttermore is that she always had joy about her. Very happy person. And if you ever called her at her home, because later when I became a nurse, I took care of Mr. Buttermore in his home, this is how she always answered her phone. Praise the Lord. It wasn't hello, it wasn't anything like that, and she wasn't a Pentecostal woman, she was a Baptist. And she would answer the phone knowing that God had something good for her. And that's, that's true joy. Now this is also, and we always love, but you don't know, you don't know what I've been through. Miss Buttermore buried two of her children. And uh, she still had joy left. She had an understanding, as hard as that was, 
It had to be the will of God or it wouldn't have happened. And so we see then that what Paul wanted to do this, I don't think it's an easy thing to do. Do you? I don't think it's a, a, a thing that happens to most people. In fact, after seeing as many people as I have leave this earth, I would say the vast majority is on the other side. They finish this course with disappointment. Uh, they, they finish this co course discouraged. They finish this go course with thinking about some things left to do. Now, that's one thing that I don't want to finish my course is thinking I should have done this for the Lord while I was living, while I had the health to do so, while I had the ability to get it accomplished. And I believe that was one element of joy that Paul was able to hang on to to the very end because he accomplished, accomplished great things in his ministry. So going back to our text in verse 18, the Bible says, and when they came to him, and this is Paul, uh, it was the uh, probably the maybe seventh or fifth Pentecost after the Lord Jesus Christ had gone back to the Almighty, and uh, he had gone to Jerusalem for Pentecost. And when they were come to him, he said, of the, and he said unto them. You know that from the first day that I came unto Asia, after what manner I've been with you at all seasons. So the first thing, and I believe this certainly is an element of joy, is no regrets. Now, I've seen a lot of people die, but I've seen few die without regrets. Now, I could use a lot of names, and I'm not going to do that. One thing, this broadcast out, and another thing, it's just, it's just not the purpose. But I knew a man here in this county, he very, very prominent man, and very, and, but what his burning desire was money. And he had it. He had it. And he probably one of the most wealthy men I ever knew in my life. But he died because I watched him die. Very, very sad. He had no joy. Because you know, when he looked back those 70 years or so, whatever he lived, what was the one theme of his life? Chasing money. And that, and, and that, and that was the summation of his life. Nothing to further the cause of Christ. Uh, he didn't even uh, claim to believe in Christ until just a year or so before he died. Uh, and, and so we find a lot of wasted time. But Paul says, you saw how I lived when I was with you. And it's either genuine or fake. You know, it, what I found, it doesn't take you very long to, uh, to spot a fake Christian. And you know what? They'll, 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 they won't finish with joy. They'll be miserable. They'll be upset. Uh, they'll be fretful at the thought of death. And so he says, you know. So what was one thing that they knew about Paul's joy? They watched it. They saw it. You know what? I, I don't want people to perceive me as an unhappy person. Do you? I have everything in the in the world to be thrilled about. I'm going home to be with the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm going to be able to sit at the throne of the Almighty Jehovah with Jesus at His right hand and give them praise forever, ever more. What could be better? How, how would you prefer to spend an eternity than that? I don't have ever reason to have the deepest joy of any creature on this planet. So why don't we? Why don't we? Uh, verse 19. Serving the Lord with all humility of mind. Now, what do you think about serving people? Now, uh, we have Madison back there. You like serving people? I bet there's good and bad to it, ain't it? About like nursing. Good and bad to it. Uh, take trades patient's room. I don't want this. Okay. 
and you don't go, well, eat it anyway, uh, then you have to say, well, what would you like? That's not serving with joy, is it? What I really want to do is dress them with it, right? So where's the joy in this? You know what? It's very hard to be a servant and be joyful at the same time, is it not? Because if they say jump, what do you got to say? How high? Right? Uh, it, it takes a very special kind of person to be happy as a servant. And yet still, I believe that that's where Paul's joy was found. He was, his joy was found in his ministry in serving the people of God. And, and, and that's amazing to me, but he remembered, if I'm going to be happy, this is what I've got to do. Serving the Lord with all humility of mind and with many tears and temptations. Now, if you underline in your Bible, you get tears and temptations down because first of all, what is tears suggest, suggestive of? Sadness, right? So that says to me, just like it would to me, that being a servant isn't always pleasant, isn't always glad, isn't always something that, that is just the best thing you've ever done. And then he also says, with temptations. Now, like I said with my example of my patient and want to dress them down with whatever I had on the tray, that's a temptation, right? It, it, it takes a bigger person, it takes a stronger person spiritually to say, I'm sorry, what would, what would you like to have? Now, you know, if mother used to say, you can say anything, right? <laughs> but you do not mean it, yeah. right? And so we see then, not only did Paul say this, he really meant it. He, he knew that there were temptations that would pull him from the cause of Christ, that would pull him for, from sincere service. Now, uh, surely uh, a church like this can understand sincere and fake. You ever wonder why the Lord don't meet more with his people today? Listen, dear friends, he knows the difference between sincere and fake, too. Amen. Uh, and, and so we see that Paul wanted better than that for his spiritual life. <clears throat> which befell upon me by the lying in wait of the Jews. Now, I want you to see that there is always an origin, always a, a push from someone to steal your joy. Now, in Paul's case, it was the Jews because Paul was a Jew and now he was a Christian and they used that against him. So you look unto yourself and you will find a group that hinders you constantly. And I don't know who it may be for you. Sometimes uh, work can be pretty rough. I go in my office and shut the door and that way I don't have to deal with people. Right? It's not because I don't like people, but there's some things that I don't need to hear. Right? So uh, we, we need to understand that it is not walking through the fields of daisies. It's going to be hard. It's going to be difficult. Uh, serving the Lord is, is a challenge. And so we find that the one thing that Paul did, maybe to protect his joy and to understand that his joy was valuable, is look at the people that want to take it, that want to steal it, because that is a very real thing. And most of us don't even know who they are. You know who wanted to steal my joy as a young man? The people I identified as friends. So don't look on the people huh, that are going to be abject enemies to you, that, that face you in a devil costume. Look at the people that you least suspect. And, and, and so we see that uh, Paul understood uh, his joy taker, and he had, he had him uh, he had him identified as such. Verse 20, and how I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you. 
Now, he had identified his enemy, and secondly, he, he did what was profitable for the churches. Uh, we think of profit as money, gaining, uh, maybe investing a certain amount of money and gaining the interest on it, and it's profitable for us. Maybe selling a piece of land, and that becomes profitable. But spiritually speaking, how do you know what's profitable? How do you know what's valuable? What would be the best thing for me as your pastor to give you? Now, I was talking to a boy yesterday. He goes to a church. Uh, and I, I, don't, I don't, again, I'm not going to say who it was and who the pastor is. But I do know this. He's a very sincere man. He says he believes in grace. But there's no impact of the gospel in his life. I've seen him dress worse than the world. So would I be doing you a justice to say that's okay? You see what I'm saying? I need to do what's prompt. You know what? One thing, I'll stand before the Almighty one day and I will give an answer to what I preach. So I can tell you that there's, uh, there's repercussions for that. Or I can tell you, hey, it's a okay. Do as you please. Put what you want to on. I can do one or the other. One's profitable and the other's not. And, I'm, and I, I, I think fully the other side of it's more detrimental than you can think about. And, and so we find that Paul's other way to keep joy in the world's eye would be stupid. Because listen, if you preach like I do, and what the few good men that are left, listen, you're not going to have them busting out the walls and having to build onto the building and all that stuff that goes on today. What it's going to be is few and far between, but it's profitable. It's good. You know what? I'd rather have a half a dozen that means business with God than 60 that's just, uh, just throwing darts at it. And so we see that one way that he protected his joy was to preach the truth, to give them what was profitable, to identify the enemy and give them what was profitable. Verse 22, uh, excuse me, verse 21, testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance toward God. Now, exactly what Brother Jarrett was saying uh, uh, teaching this morning, nothing different between the Jews and the Greeks, repentance toward God. Uh, before there's any believing faith, there will be repentance. And, you know, be it, Brother Downs used to talk about that, and, and, and the way the human mind works, we want sequential things. First this happens, and then this happens, and then this happens. Well, redemption that comes from God, it all happens at one time, but it yet and still it's separate. You know when you'll be sorry over sin? Once you have a new life. And you want, you know what? The, the best thing you'll do with sin while you're lost is try to hide it. Right? And, and, and most, in the day which we live today, it's flamboyant. It, it's right out there before you. You know, it, it, it just drives me insane, this thing with gender. Uh, I, I want to say, well, I can tell you what you are. Right? I mean, that, that, that's just foolishness. And, and, and that, that is just meant to take our minds off our purpose and off the, the God that we serve. And, and so Paul reminds them there, there's no difference. The key element is repentance. Repentance and faith, just as Jarrett brought out so pointedly, toward our Lord Jesus Christ. So that's another element. If you if you have joy, if you if, if you if you possess any joy this morning, a huge element is your faith. Believing that God in fact is all that he says he is that Jesus accomplished everything in his earthly ministry that he intended to, and that he died specifically for you, rose again the third day a glorious victor, and is sitting now at the right hand of God. You know what? The older I get, the more I see that that, that takes a huge amount of faith. 
Did you ever think about that? Uh, you know, and, and when kids, my grandchildren here and my daughter, at that age, they're so tender-hearted. And you know, when I was a boy growing up in Carlisle, I didn't know anybody that didn't believe in God. You know what I'm saying? But as you get older, it's kind of like with medicine and other things, you doubt the efficacy. <laughs> Is my blood pressure medicine really worth it? Me and Adam had a, a talk about that yesterday and his new interventions to lower his blood pressure. And uh, how much confidence do you have in Christ? I love old brother Dan, I mean brother uh, Garner Smith, and I, I, this will be the one thing I will always remember he said. He said, Larry, I have so much confidence in the grace of Christ that I would swing across hell on a dry corn stalk. Now that, 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 that's faith, and you know what? I want that kind of faith, don't you? Uh, that Christ is truly, and he is, he certainly is. Christ is truly that sufficient. But we doubt, do we? So if you don't have joy this morning, it could be simply because you're doubting, you're questioning, you're wondering. Listen, if you're saved, Christ is sufficient. He is full. He is complete. You do not have to worry about that. In verse 22, And now, behold, I go bound in the Spirit. Now, I want to I want to just give you an aside to this uh, bounding of Paul. Uh, he was arrested, so that may have been part of the bounding. But if you remember when he got to Rome, it said that he even walked around and kind of did what he wanted to for a while. And that he, he taught the believers there uh, deeper things about Christ. And it got worse with time, but... He wasn't treated badly at first. So how was he bound? And if your King James Bible, it says a little S spirit. Now after 25 years, bound in the little S spirit. Now what's your spirit about? You know what? Sometimes, uh, and sometimes I don't, but sometimes I still uh, get excited about nursing. It's part of my spirit. It's part of who I am, and it will always be that way. That's part of my spirit. I get excited about seeing my children be successful. I'm their father. That's supposed to be the way it is. That's part of my spirit. So he wasn't saying I'm bound in handcuffs. My spirit desires more than anything else, my inward man, to see Christ preached. He was bound in the spirit. So another way to keep your joy is not being bound to this world, but be bound in the spirit that is Christ. You know what? We get way bound up in this world too much, don't we? Oh, I've got to make a little bit more money. I've got to do that. I've got to do this. I've got to do this. No, no. Listen to me, dear friend. Don't be bound by this world. You know, uh, 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 come out from among them and be your shepherds, not just, you know, so that we'll look like freaks to the world. It's so that we'll set that part aside and be bound in the Spirit. Our obligation to Christ. That's what he wanted. That, that's what he thought would be the most joyful thing is to be bound to Christ. And he said, I'm bound. Behold, I go bound in the Spirit unto Jerusalem, not knowing the things that shall fall befall me there, save that the Holy Ghost witnesseth in every city. He said, I don't know what's going to happen when I get back to Jerusalem. But I knew that this, the Holy Ghost is witnessing. You know, whether your lady is <coughs> taking someone aside at the grocery, or if you're talking to your children, if the Holy Ghost shows up, that's sufficient. He says, I know the Holy Ghost is speaking to people. That's all I need. You ever been in a service, you were so convinced that the Holy Spirit, the person of God for the church age, had come, that that's all you needed. 
You know, we, uh, we live in a day of big lights and big shows, don't we? What I want is the Holy Ghost. Man. And, and, and that's enough joy there for me. You know, uh, just I've had enough revival in my life to know that I crave it more. Because it, uh, it, it brings the joy that we need. And so we find, as Paul is writing, uh, or is talking with Luke, he says, listen, the Holy Ghost is witnessing, and that's sufficient for me. Saying that the bonds and afflictions abide in me, but none of these things move me. Now you think about the worst news you possibly could get. I think in the modern day, most of us would think cancer. Don't you? That's, that's bad news. If I live to be 100, I'll never forget sitting across from Dr. Shaw's desk, Judy beside me, saying, it's bad, it's stage four, it's literally everywhere. That's bad news, isn't it? Yeah. That's, 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 that's something hard to bear. And you know why? We count our life years to ourselves, do we not? Do you count your physical life more dear than your service to Christ? I think the reason that Paul was so happy that he counted his service to Christ more dear than his life. And, and, and you know what? The best I can understand from this text is giving great joy and happiness, getting things in proper priority. We need that today, do we not? We need to have this life and the life to come in proper, uh, in proper sequence so we can serve the, letter, the Lord better. But none of these things move me, neither count my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy. I want to hang on to my joy. I want to possess my joy to the end. What a, what a great blessing that would be. The sad part is we, we don't know how we'll finish, finish this course. That I remember, none of my family lived to be old enough really to do, develop Alzheimer's. You know what? I would much rather say, here, Larry, you have stage four cancer, than them look at me and say, you have early stage Alzheimer's. I can say that with all surety. I would rather hear the cancer any day of the week. Because I see, it, uh, you know what? By and large, those people are people most miserable. They want so bad to understand what's going on around them, and they can't. That wouldn't be finishing with joy, would it? That would be tough. That would be hard. Not even literally remembering what your own name is. How miserable would that be? And I, I can't even put words to it. I've seen it all my life and don't even understand it. It would take our joy, would it not? So how will you finish up? Will it be Alzheimer's? Will it be cancer? Will it be a heart attack? The simple truth is that nobody under the sound of my voice knows. But what we do know is it is coming. And that we can, as Paul, now often we don't, but we can finish with joy. I think the real question is, are you going to finish with joy, right? Do you have the determination within your mind that I'm going to be joyful to the end because I put Christ first? That's where happiness lies. That's where, that's where joy is found. Now, go with me very quickly back to Acts chapter 7, and we'll look very quickly at a case in point, and uh, we'll be done. Acts chapter 7, uh, toward the end, all of you know this, uh, 
the story of Stephen. He preaches a great sermon. He calls the Jews for what they're worth. He cuts no punches. He tells them that they're a stiff, stiff necked and unholy people. Then uh, verse 55 is, we'll begin in 54. Verse 54, he gives this great sermon. And I want you to see across the audience, there was no, Amen! Amen! Glory to God! But the response was quite different. And when he heard these things, and when they heard these things, they were cut. They, and when they heard these things, they were cut to the heart, and they gnashed on him with their teeth. Now, I've seen some bad services, and I've seen some times uh, where I wanted the, the kids sitting on the back pew so they could get out quick. But so far, nobody's bit me. That's what this means. They, they it wasn't saying, we hate you, Paul, shut up. When you gnash on someone, you literally bite them. That was the type of sermon. That was the reception. No amens, no glory to God, but literally be, being bitten. Verse 55. Now, but he, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Now, oh, uh, Oh, Stephen was as good as dead when this transpired because nobody can see God and live. But you know what? He finished with joy. Can you imagine being bitten? And then it says they took him outside the city and began stoning, throw rocks at him. You ever had anybody throw a rock at you? I always rely on Judy. Judy threw some rocks at me. Right? She wasn't a very good shot, I'll say that. Um, but so, so overrun with hate and despise to start throwing rocks at you. You know what? The response to truth isn't always favorable. That's one lie that's come out of the new generation of preachers and everybody's going to appreciate it. No, dear friend, they're not. Many of the responses are not going to be good. And they began to throw rocks at him. And he said, I see the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of the Father. And the Bible says they stopped up their ears. And then they began. But what does the very end say? The Bible says he fell asleep. Now, I don't believe he'd been conked in the head and it knocked him out. I don't believe he was dying. I believe he had the peace of God that passeth all understanding. And he literally lay down in the midst of being stunned and fell asleep. You know what that is? That's joy. That's gladness. That's peace. You want to you be more happy? than you were yesterday. The world's not going to give it to you. Adam and Sarah need a new roof. Not a lot to be happy about there, is it? Depends if Farm Bureau's going to pay for it. Uh, you can be happy. You can have joy. At least you have a roof. All right? Joy. But you know what? If, if, if you literally are living in a tent, there is joy out there. What about Abraham? Jared taught him Abraham. He left Ur of the Chaldees and never had another home again. Ever. Lived to be 167? 137? Something like that. I can't remember exactly. 175. 175. Never had a place to live after that day forward. But you know what? I believe he had great joy. I believe he had great gladness. See, living in a tent is too good for us, ain't it? 
No. Perceiving when our joy is. Are you going home when this life is done to be with the Lord Jesus Christ? That's the only real joy this life will bring. You can have lots of nice things. You can have a really nice home and feel very, very empty on the inside. And I'll say this, and I'll be done. I took care of a hospice patient one time. And I knocked on the door, and I knew I was way out of my league. It was in Clarksville. And the door itself was 12 foot tall. They had 14 foot ceilings in the house. And I'm like, and I checked my address twice to be sure I was in the right spot. And I was, and I rapped on the door and I introduced myself. And she goes, well, I'm Joyce, but I'm not dying. And so I looked again and I said, well, this is the right house. I said, could I come in and uh, talk to her husband? Well, Joyce don't want to accept it, so she's pretending that she doesn't have cancer. Seems foolish, don't it? Her money couldn't buy what she wanted, could it? I did not attend her death, Betsy did. But you know what happened to Joyce? She died. We need about people who lie to herself. You know, uh, you really get down on them quick, can't you? But what I've found about people who lie to themselves, they're trying to get some kind of level of comfort. Like when people say they're saved and they're not. When people, when people have lost their joy and pretend to be happy. We need to be truthful this morning. You, you want revival? You really want some joy back in your life? It begins with honesty. It begins of saying, this is where I'm at, and I need some help.